So, thank you very much for coming and taking the time to talk to us today. We look forward to your talk. Can we please welcome Sidney? <laughs> Thanks, Sam. That's a great introduction. I think we can probably just leave it there. <laughs> That'll be good. So, um, as a as a start, who can I just get a feel for who knows about this issue? Who knows that all the companies basically pollute for profit? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I mean, a few years ago, that would have been like one or two people saying that. So that makes me feel good. And okay, as to start with. We don't have anything, we don't have any grudges against the people that work for water companies or the Environment Agency. We've got very good relationships with Environment Agency, less Environment Agency, but many water company people. And uh, that, that is, um, that's it. That's a situation that we kind of exploit and we like to, to live with because they are part of the solution. Part of the problem are the people at the top of those organizations and the shareholders, as we know, as we're going to talk about. So if I say anything really unpleasant about these organisations, and I'm going to, then it's not, that's not about those, those people that we're, we're talking about. Uh, no, it's all right, this is fine. Yeah, yeah thank you. I'm good. Yeah, thanks. So we're a pan-political organisation. You can't be a political, you can't avoid the politics. This is all about <coughs> politics now to make something happen. But we, we will work with anybody within reason. Our aims are under end on Treaty Two H improved effluent standards, which are not returning clean water to our rivers. That's nonsense. We'll, you'll see what that means. That's not what happens in many cases, and to make our rivers safe for all. So, we like the idea that people can swim in rivers and seas un untouched. I spoke to some swimmers this morning in the sea down there, and uh, and that that's a great uh, community for for kind of seeing what's really happening. But we also care about the other end of it. We care about the mayfly and the bugs and the, and the whole ecosystem because without that, we are slightly lost. And we do it by through investigation, forensic investigation really, communication and education. We, you know, we, we use the media a lot. The media loves this stuff, but we'll only love it for so long. We have to make things happen very quickly. Uh, and engagement with uh, government, water companies, uh, regulators, uh, and um, we also start to use the law because so often you think, well, you try taking the rational argument and the evidence to the people at the top, the people in charge, and you, you will find that nothing actually happens unless you can find out what presses their buttons. So sometimes that's the law, that's the, the prospect of actually going to court. We're a registered charity, small registered charity, low budget. We, we don't seek money, we seek results, and we've got great people working for free. So we're going to talk about um, what's, uh, what is sewage pollution, a little bit about that. Try and judge what you, you like to, uh, what, what helps and uh, what you want to listen to, whether it's legal or le illegal. Why does it happen? Uh, the technical and financial reasons for that. It's a big subject, so I'm going to skim across a, a, a lot of it. Are the effects of sewage pollution and how and why regulation <coughs> has failed. Peter's going to talk about that more than I am. Uh, what can be revealed through data analysis, he's definitely going to talk about that. And uh, some recent relevant science. Also, uh, there'll be a Q&A and uh, we'll talk about the ongoing, perhaps the long, ongoing legal actions that are happening. There's now quite a lot of legal stuff going on. So a quick review then. What is all this about? The water companies were privatised in 1989 after 10 years of enforced austerity where those regional water, water authorities were not allowed to borrow money and then Margaret Thatcher criticised them all the time for not spending money that she wouldn't let them borrow and that paved the way to a privatisation that the country frankly did not want. But it, they dropped it from their manifesto prior, prior to the election. As soon as they got elected, they did it. Mm -hmm. And it's gone the way that many of those privatizations have gone. The economic regulator is off what? Uh, very friendly people, we like them a lot, but they are hopeless, they are a dreadful <laughs> failure, and they really do not know what the hell is going on. But, and and um, they, they, they've got some very good people, but the, the organization is not built to know what's going on. 
the environmental regulator even worse, the environment agency, uh, very, very disingenuous uh, now that at leadership level, uh, its previous chief executive, Sir James Bevan, just told, just made stuff up and, and um, got it into Hansard, um, got it into various committee hearings, largely unchallenged, and we're working on that. The industry claims to have invested £160 billion pounds of what knows nothing about what that money was spent on. All they know is that nitrate, phosphate and ammonia have all been reduced from sewage works, and that isn't even true. So that's how, that's how bad it is. For every, uh, for every pound uh, that the water companies spent, bear in mind they extracted about £72 billion pounds in, in dividends, that means we, we paid them about 45 pence for every pound they spent. Now, if anybody thinks that's a great deal, put up your hands and I'll make a financial arrangement with you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, the industry now admits to underinvestment and now wants us all to, all to pay for it. Yeah. They've reached the licensing of, of, uh, of what that says they can't take money if it's going to impact on the ability of the company to work properly mm -hmm. uh, or to damage its credit rating. They've breached that, but of course the money's gone to the to companies, uh, to, to funds like the Sovereign Wealth Fund of China. You can imagine how much enthusiasm our government has for getting money back from the government of China. And the industry is subject to monitoring itself. What a great idea. Pollution mm -hmm. <laughs> is profitable. So, what, what is sewage? Uh, it's a lot of stuff. It's human waste, um, obviously the paper, the chemicals, the drugs, the hormones, the bacteria and viruses, Fats, oil, and grease, you know about that by the sound of things. <laughs> Parasites, undigested food, phosphates and nitrates, and that general wastewater. And some of that stuff, if you look in the supermarket next time you go in, just stand in the kind of laundry aisle and the cleaning aisle, just look at those, those endless packets and bottles of stuff, and just realize that is all going into your local river or sea. Treated or untreated. That's where that stuff is headed. And some of these things, this is very, this is very liquid. That's labelled harmful to aquatic life with long lasting effects. And when you try to ask Procter and Gamble, what do you mean by that? You will just get a series of letters as I have, saying if you're unhappy with your product, please, um, please um, apply for a kind of a refund. It, it, no, one, <laughs> no one knows what that is. It's quite, quite disturbing. And of course there's trade waste. Water companies have to deal with trade waste. Every hundred houses produce about between 30 and 50 tonnes of sewage a day. So if you've got a sewage works that fails and someone builds 100 houses for, uh, on an estate, that, that stuff is only going in one place. And that is that's happening all around the country. Those over, overwhelmed sewage works have just been, have been made uh, worse in their performance by houses being added by the water companies just saying, yes, we can cope with taking the extra money, thanks very much. And the, the plan is just accepting it. And we've, we've started to break that now. Uh, it's a whole different story. If you want to know more about using planning law to, to um, make sure that they do upgrade, then look on our <coughs> website. There are a couple of blogs on there, windrushwasp.org. The so plan is basically, people use the sewage system, it goes to the, the wastewater treatment facility, which is on the top right, and if it, if it gets overwhelmed, it goes into a river over, over some kind of a simple weir structure and it, and it spills. Uh, and, that, and that's supposed to happen in exceptional circumstances. But, uh, and they would have said, and did say, and still do say, we only do this to stop sewage backing up into your home. We're doing you a favor by stopping that happening. But the real reason, is that the water industry has not updated its infrastructure, it hasn't got the capacity, so it spills basically whenever it wants. And the regulators have let it happen because they will only prosecute those most serious offences that, that are found largely by the public. So most pollution happens at a chronic, more chronic level and they get away with it every time. And the idea is that there will be sewage works all around the country. This is Sidmouth, you recognise it. And you'll have a sewage works that will, will take this stuff, and Peter's going to talk, talk to you more about the detail of how that place performs. 
because it looks like that, and it would have looked like that for a very long time. Google Earth, the, the historical images, are a very good tool to see if things have changed in terms of extra extra assets being built. Mostly, you're not, it'll be a spot the difference competition, and you won't see anything. Maybe a few plants have changed, but that's about it. And we know, um, this is an extract from Jill Plimmer's work from the Financial Times, she's done a lot of work with us. That, that was the, uh, the revelation, basically, that water companies have just dropped off investment, and it's all dropped like a, like a rock. Um, and they, as they've worked out, they can get away with it. And of, of course, to deal with this, I'm going to do questions at the end, otherwise I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm, your, I'm a hopeless timekeeper. Sorry. Is your uh, uh, presentation going to be available, that's all I yeah, I think so. I think we're filming it. Yeah, yeah. So, the group structures of these companies are also there. So they're not just a company regulated by the regulators. There is only one. This is terms of water. There's only one section of that that stack of companies that is actually regulated. And that's terms of water utilities limited. All around that, they build up all sorts of unregulated companies to move money around. They used to use the Cayman Islands until that became an embarrassment they stopped using it we're not sure how it works now southern water i think use maybe the the, the cayman islands i don't know about southwest water uh, but they're all up to financial trickery and you see the owners the ownership is abu dhabi it's it's china it's canada it's it's uh, the 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 smell of money easy money was so strong that it attracted these funds from all over the world and typically, sewage will uh, come to a works. This is Cassington. Now, Cassington is not is quite in, uh, linked to Sidmouth in that it's got a two a two kilometre pipe that goes into the Thames, whereas you've got a long pipe that goes into the sea. So there is a similarity here. This one, in, the water industry and uh, Offworld will claim that what happens is that sewage will go to a sewage works. It will get prim a primary settlement. Now, these are not primary settlement tanks. They were, but they've been repurposed. So there's no primary settlement here. That should settle out the worst of the sludge. It then goes into something like this. It'll either be those filter beds, where those arms go around in circles over gravel, or this one, this kind of thing, a bit more sophisticated, where they pump air into it to encourage bacterial activity to break down the sewage. Now, this will happen. The, the, the time that sewage spends in the sewage works in this country is about six to eight hours. So you can imagine how little actually happens. In, in Zurich, it's about 18 hours. So they spin it through as fast as they can. In fact, this one's been really working hard. Uh, and then it goes to the final settlement tanks here. And then it goes to a, an outfall where it's sampled and it makes its way down to the uh, this one, in this case, the Thames. Now you're gonna see at the end what the state of that treated effort looks like. And that will be the same in, in many uh, countries. So you can get information if you want to, if anybody is inclined to do this, you can get information like um, the, the network maps uh, and you can see the catchments that apply to these things. This was this drone footage was done for me by somebody that does the camera work for um, Top Gear. And he was very good with his, with his uh, drone. Seagulls, we've got those in common. <laughs> Seagulls. Seagulls are good at finding this kind of stuff. Now that is, those are actually used as storm tanks. They've been repurposed, they're huge, and they're used to take uh, excess uh, sewage, which they're supposed to do. They're supposed to store it in storm, storm tanks, two hours worth of it, to take out the worst here before they start dumping. Now, in many cases, these events happen for, for weeks and months. So taking two hours out of the beginning is very much a token gesture. And when people say, just build bigger storm tanks, you're gonna to need to build a massive storm tank to deal with four months of, of unbeaten spilling, as you will have. It's happening in many places. Here we go, down the pipeline, across the A40, traffic jam, generally. <laughs> <laughs> all the way down, yeah, it's flowing. All the way down to the Thames, Then we're going to talk about what's coming out of that at the end. Oops, how's that not uh, an order on in it? Right, yeah, there we go. Now, this is a typical outfall where they'll split um, on the left. Um, this is treated sewage on the left, 
and there has to be a meet a permit standard. Peter's going to talk to you about the permit standards. They're generally pretty easy to achieve. Sorry, could you speak up a little bit? Say again? Could you speak up? Oh, sorry, yeah. Anyone else? Um, I'll shout a bit. Right. So it, it, that's, that's you've got the left hand side untreated, that's treated sewage on the left hand side, quite clear I mean, mostly, but when you put a pro proper camera into it, you'll see what it really is. But to achieve the permit standards that it has to make, it's allowed to dump untreated sewage because it can't treat all of it, and it's dumping untreated sewage right next to it, <laughs> which just seems to make a, a mockery of the whole affair. Treated affluent successfully achieved by releasing untreated sewage, often illegally, not the short events, nothing to do with the Victorians, not their fault, <laughs> and the companies are allowed to monitor themselves and report themselves. Imagine how often that happens. Uh, they are dependent on being able to break the law. In fact, Thames Water just asked for a cap on fines. So if that's not a, like really an ambition that they just intend to break the law, what is? Isn't that bizarre? And one of the reasons that these things happen for such long periods is groundwater infiltration. So the water will rise in the winter, the wet, wet season, above the level of the pipes underground. And they're so leaky in many cases, so badly maintained, that great volumes of water get into them. Tree roots have got in, whatever else, there are breaks in it. They can cope with a certain amount of infiltration. In fact, it's kind of helpful to them sometimes. But the, in many cases, certainly in our area, Whitney Sewage Works, they've, no, they've known and documented evidence of knowing exactly that that was the problem at Whitney since 1996 and done nothing about it. And uh, that, is a, that is one of the biggest causes of, of the long spills in dry weather. So you can find out more about this on the Rivers Trust map, which is a great resource. Put in Rivers Trust sewage map, and you'll find that, and you'll find out where your nearest. Um, overflows are and how they've been performing. So I picked that one out because it had such a big number attached to it. Not exceptionally big, but a larger larger number. Sort of 80 days of, of untreated spilling <coughs> of sewage, which is not really the short event that we were being told about. That's a typical, a typical separated outfall. That's Whitney charging out uh, huge volumes of, of uh, sewage, that, so much so that that created, created sewage fungus over 1.6 kilometres of the Colwell Brook, which leads down to the, to the Windrush, and sewage fungus is not something that's pleasant, as you can imagine, some gloopy, pinky brown stuff that coats everything, um, and it's uh, particularly gross. And then you have a, this is where they blend the two together, Fairford, the two things are mixed, so you can go to the river and think, well, that's just a, the sewage outfall, and this is coming out at such a rate, this is, this is actually, this is pushing particles in an aerosol effect into the air. So people are breathing this stuff in as well. And this, this is, um, you see it, you can see the brownish, greyish water at the top. You can see the mixture, that's underwater. And it's just piling that into the limestone stream that is the River Colm. And all of that doesn't go away, of course. It doesn't just suddenly magically disappear. It embeds itself in the fabric of the river. That, all that organic matter, if we're going to be polite about it, uh, and all those other things we listed, they embed themselves in the river, coat the riverbed, cause algal blooms, cause slime and uh, diatoms to coat everything, and it, it, is, um, it then reappears, it's, it's, it rears its head in the warmer months when the sun comes up, and, uh, and we all see what happens to our rivers. Some of them will have that telltale debris around them. They're getting good, in our area, they're getting very good at stopping this because they know we exploit these pictures. And, we, we, um, and so does Mark Barrow up in, in um, Ilkley. And then you have, um, of course, these other things that are completely off the radar, not monitored at all, just manhole covers, inspection covers, that surcharge and will just leak sewage out and into the nearest stream. Now that's a quite important because if you're seeing a damaged river, you think, well, there's no sewage works here. There's no outfall here. Often I've found that to be the case. And you, you do a bit of, bit of um, question a few people, ask a, ask a few local people what's going on, and you'll find one of these sources. And this is what that actually looks like. Uh, uh, this is another one. It's going to National Trust land at Sherbourne, Sherbourne that's been on spring watch. This was leaking. This was leaking for weeks. It's in the field. Who's going to know? It should, the water company should, because the sewage isn't arriving. But they, but they um, let it happen. 
There was a lot there, and luckily, yeah, yeah I, should have, I actually, I actually should have written something in that. And I think I know what that I should have written. And that that went down to the down to the to the Sherpa Brook. Luckily, it settled out most of it because if you imagine that that poured directly into the brook that you're going to see, there would have been a massive fish kill. But a lot of it settled out in the wood. But you could see how long it was going for before anybody realised. And, uh, and stopped it, and now it goes into which is a lovely brook, which is in poor, um, poor ecological status, surprisingly enough. Well, not really, when you realise that's happening to it. And there are more of those locations in that area, and we know that's what happens to that brook. There are no sewage works discharging to it. That is the, that is the, the pollution source that, um, that affects it, completely off the radar. I like this video because it kind of sums up everything that goes wrong with sewage pollution. This is the Chilbrook. It passes through farmland. Now a lot of our farmers are uh, either kind of organic, they're very responsible anyway. We're not, we're not uh, intensively farmed. It's gone through farmland, it's gone past Carterton, which is a big, big town. Uh, and then it comes to a sewage works. This is above the sewage works. I love this place. It's very rare that you can find it. Places like this, beautiful. And then you go past the sewage works and, and um, you'll see what happens immediately. And then it will travel down the video to past the second sewage works at Bampton. And then we'll see something, um, something else attached to it. But enjoy the first bit. <laughs> These little fish are there all the time. All, all kind of year, year sized trout. They're all the same, sim similar sizes of, of uh, in, in different numbers. Then you've gone past the sewage works. And this is typical. That, that brown and green algae, that's a plant trying to live in there. That is actually a plant that is choked. And then you come down to that. It's just below Bamps and Sewage Works. We're there for a long time. Orange foam. And we reported it to the Environment Agency. They got the water company to investi investigate it. The water company get their contractors to come out. They investigate it. They said that foam, that's uh, natural. <laughs> that little foam, don't worry about that. I say that a lot, we hear that a lot about that foam. So we stuck a floating white pipe above the sewage works and one below the sewage works. One above the sewage works collected nothing. One below the sewage works collected a load of orange foam. So that's how difficult it is to prove that that stuff is coming out of sewage works, not cardio foam. And, 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 it was, and it was an indicator of shockingly bad effluent, actually, which was the, which was the real purpose of, of what we did. Uh, sorry. But it, it's, the, it's just an indicator of how poor regulation is, because everything you saw in that, that environmental destruction, that doesn't even get registered as an event. That's not even thought to be a thing by the Environment Agency, let alone something to prosecute. It's basically ignored and that's happened to so many of our rivers uh, this is well i think about it if you any of you've got photographs or video of any of your local rivers back in the day before they they turned into similar shadows of their former selves they are great campaign material and if you want to if you've got them in some old super eight thing in a loft somewhere and you want some help converting it let us know because we'll we do that and we'll let you have a copy back they are a great way to to prove what people will deny and the other way is to go back in time, like, like this, and this is a Windrush, back in the day, and I couldn't believe it when I had this converted, I thought they've done it wrong. That, what's that golden stuff on the bottom? And it's gravel, and it's how gravel should look. And that's the, that's the fish life, it's a bad old clip, but you can see there's a shoulder barbel, they're about 18 inches long. It's a big, beautiful fish. That were common. That's the same place, <coughs> exactly the same place. And that is miserable. And it went down probably from about 20, 2013, 14, 15, it started to go really downhill. Um, yeah, so now only 14% of our rivers are in good ecological status. In the Thames region, that's 6%, and that's probably not even accurate. It's probably even worse than that. So when the Chief Executive of the Environment Agency said rivers are in better condition now than at any time since the start of the Industrial Revolution, <laughs> his own data said no. And um, the Environment Agency says on the Windrush that the, the, uh, this is the macrophyte survey, which is um, uh, 
plant life in and uh, on in the river and on river banks, right? So they say that the river windrush is in a better state now than it was in 2009, slightly better. And in that time, you can see the pictures above are uh, in 2010 and 2009, and below are in 2020 and 2017. Basically, all the wind, all the weed disappeared out of the river windrush, and the and the river is devoid of generally of of good ranunculus life or whatever. But the Environment Agency tells you a different story. It tells you it's better. And they did that, I'm told, through a source of cooperation by counting the plants on the bank. <laughs> Which you might think is just a very dishonest thing to do. I certainly do. But that's what they report to government. And, and uh, because this is a science festival, well, we talk about nitrate, and I know people are interested in nitrate, because this is the river, this is a little haven, a tepary. And, and it shows you what happens when you go, when you take clear water and you pass the sewage works. This is treated effluent that's doing this. This was in July 2022. It's a Wessex water place. Um, and upstream of it, you've got the old GoPro is a great device, a GoPro on a stick. It will show you things that, that you, you really wouldn't believe. So it's very, very clear water. There's no real, there's a little bit of remains of something hanging on there, but there's no uh, algal life touching any of that. It's above Tepary Sewage Works. That's Tepary Sewage Works coming out. It looks still relatively clear, but you see the algae immediately. You see the algae. They, they strip phosphate there. Uh, they still, um, the phosphate, interestingly, above the works was quite high, 0.6 or so, and it was then it stayed about the same below because they phosphate strip. But the, the nitrate, you see the, the gray clouding on the left there, just a little bit starting to look gray. Then you go downstream, and you see immediately what happens. That brown algae, brown and green algae, is just coating everything. A little bit further down, 100 meters further down, because these things don't happen immediately. You've got to give them a little bit of time, and that, that time moves downstream, of course. And that's the riverbed. That would have been a clear gravel riverbed, probably with, but with plant life in it. No rooted plants. And look at the color of it. Already, the colour has changed. It's gone murky, and that is, according to the Environment Agency, one of the one of the key effects of high uh, of high um, nutrient input. So that's exactly what you're seeing. You're seeing um, abundant algae. You're seeing um, the water often cloudy, low plant diversity. That's it. But the agency will now deny that that slide even it exists. And finally, we'll go back to the outfall now of that sewage works at Carterton. This is, uh, sorry, at uh, Cassington. And we're gonna drop in three meters down, hard to find, we eventually found it. Here it comes, here's the pipe that's coming out after two kilometers. Treated effluent, we return clear water to the river. Here it comes. That, those are bacterial, bacterial colonies, flock. Um, rising out of the final settlement tanks. That's sweet corn, okay. undigested food. I filmed that one day, I could have actually filmed up, filled up a tin of Jolly Green Giant, recycled <laughs> it, I didn't. And, and there, that, I filmed that day with a German TV company, ARD, and that condom jumped out as a gift to me. <laughs> with, the, with, with a little bit of sunlight in the background. So, don't ever believe those companies when they tell you they return clean water to the river. Who knows what's coming out of that pipe? The seagulls know. And if you can't ask them, you need to get someone to go there with a camera on a clear day when you've got clear water. I'm going to hand over to Peter now. Just bear with me while I get my slide. <laughs> <laughs> could, could I also ask for a show of hands in turn? Sorry. Oh yeah. Sorry. Apologies. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's got a bigger screen. Yeah. It's got a bigger plane than me.
seven and seven eighths when I was 11. I remember my mother trying to buy me a cap and, 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 and a, for a school uniform. And the guy in the shop said, this is very unusual. <laughs> anyway, it's mainly on one side, actually. Um, so can I have a show of hands? How many of you are, are local um, Sidmouth and how many of you are like Southwest? And there are some people, so, so it's just local, immediately local? Oh, really the majority of people, great. Because I wasn't sure how to direct what I'm going to say. I have done quite a bit of local stuff and I thought you would be interested. I know some of you are already monitoring the River Lopi doing citizen science type stuff. And I hope what I'm going to say may encourage you to do more of the data analysis that might link what's happening in the sewage works with what's happening in the river. Because I think you can't really do one without the other. You should be doing both. Um, so um, what we find when we give these talks is that um, people go away and you know, they forget what we've told them. So we do have um, a group of people that we send around who may just pop up in your <laughs> Sorry, am I blocking you This is a Spike Milligan. Um, uh, thing he did on, on sewage 40 years ago. And, and uh, 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 he pops up in someone's bath, first of all. And um, and he says, what are you doing? What are you putting down this toilet? You know, and it, 40 years ago, it's just quite amazing. Anyway, mm. that aside. Um, so, Ash has shown you what happens I, um, in terms of in the river. I want to show you what's happening in the sewage works. Uh, I won't go into the actual treatment process because he's kind of explained that. I'm, I'm more interested in the, um, the regulation of what's going on and whether the Environment Agency is doing its job at regulating what the water company is doing, whether the water companies are abiding by their permits and by the law. So sewage typically uh, okay, goes into the sewage treatment works, I'm not explaining this, comes out treated, which is typically called final effluent or treated um, sewage. Um, and that's subject, as, as Ash said, to uh, controls by the Environment Agency in England and NRW in Wales. We've just done something in Wales, and I'll say a bit more about that. Um, they're, they're actually not um, taking the same approach. There's some divergence between these two regulators, which is going to be really interesting in, in the coming months. So the, the permit says your effluent quality must be to these standards. So many milligrams of ammonia per litre for what's coming out, so many suspended solids, and, and you've got to test that 12 times a year. You test it to the water company and report the data to us, and we'll, we'll, we'll check whether you're uh, doing it properly. They also say to the company, we want to know how much sewage you're treating, because we want to know whether we set the parameters in for the effluent quality right, and it's subject to how much you're able to treat of that waste, what its capacity is. So you've got to provide data. And what they ask them to do is give the, the, uh, the environment agency the number of um, cubic meters of sewage they treat every day, just that one, a number each day. Um, but they actually measure what they treat every 15 minutes. But the agency says, don't give us that detail. Just give us the summary data and we'll, we'll, we'll manage with that. And we know that when the, there's a sort of heavy rainfall or stormy weather or whatever, and, and even through just ground groundwater, there can be pressure put on the sewage works. And then the agency permits the water company to divert some of that excess over a certain amount, over and above the, uh, the capacity of the works, into a storm tank where the idea is it'll sit there for a while and then it'll go back and get treated when the rain goes away. If the rain doesn't go away, the storm tank fills, it's permitted for them to discharge untreated sewage. But the two conditions are, this must be happening because of rainfall, and they've got to keep the capacity of treatment going even when they're spilling. You know, they've got to keep maintaining that capacity. And typically what I'm finding happens is they break one or both of those conditions uh, when they're doing it. Now, previously, until four, five, six years ago, the water companies were expected to report these spills. But now, as some of you will, most of you probably know, there are now these monitors fitted on um, all these outfalls and they record when a spill starts and when it stops uh, and then that information is passed to the environment agency so that's being recorded supposedly automatically by these devices but again the agency says just tell us how many hours in a year you spill 
don't tell us when the individual spills happen, we'll just cope with that and then and, and that's what they get. Now, um, this data that's passed um, across from the water companies to the advantage is really important because that is used every year by the agency to say, well, are these individual sewage works and the water companies as a whole performing to the targets that they've been set for you this year? And then that gets fed to, to, to Offwatt, and then Offwatt interact with the water companies and they decide what the prices are that you're going to pay the following year. This is not the only information that dictates that, but obviously it's, a, it's an important thing. And you may have noticed recently that after evaluating the water companies this year, Various ones and then we're told to give money back to their customers. So Thames Water, one of the worst companies, um, was, at, was, was told they've got to pay 100 million back to their customers. So that would be shared amongst all the customers. At the opposite end, companies like Seven Trent United Utilities, two of the worst companies, the most secretive companies in terms of providing data for people like me, um, overachieved their targets, apparently, and they're able to put their prices up. So this data, its accuracy and its completeness is really crucial and will affect your pocket if it's not provided, um, as I say, in an accurate format. And also the agency are processing it properly. And so this is really what WASP has been particularly looking at. Now, I thought I'd look at Sinworth in a bit of detail because you're all local pretty well. And also it's different from most sewage works. Sigma sewage waste doesn't have storm tanks. In fact, it doesn't have a permit to discharge untreated sewage. It can't do it. It would be against the law if anything came out of the sewage waste, but that was untreated. But what you have got down on the seafront, um, quite near uh, where the river, right next to where the river Sid comes out, you've got a, 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 a pumping station it's called Ham Sewage Pumping Station, and it has a storm tank and it has the ability to spill into the River Sin, right at the sort of where it meets the, meets the sea front. So that pumps all the sewage across to the sewage works. And you also have, oh, well, I should also say that because the, the treated effluent is going into a swimming area, they have to do the ultraviolet uh, treatments as well. So it does have that additional treatment over and above most uh, sewage works. You also have several combined sewer overflows, five or six in the town, uh, and I'm just going to illustrate um, where they are. And of course, they have monitors on them and they're send, sending that information back to the control center of the sewage company, uh, and then that goes to the agency. So here we are, here's, here's um, Sidmouth. Um, we're here in this sort of yellow cross. Uh, there's the, the sewage pumping station down here. Um, so a network of, of sewers, I assume, use gravity to take the, the sewage from your homes down to the pumping station, which pumps it all the way back up to here. Uh, and that's the sewage work, as I've just shown you. That's where it, it will be treated, it will be tested, the effort will be tested, and then it comes all the way back down again, down to here. And you, if you look at the historical picture on, on Google Earth, I had to tweak the... Um, the picture a little so you could see the pipeline um, and it's 600 meters long and another way of seeing it is a lot of these historic which is a lot of seabirds at the end of it now the question is is what's coming out like you saw at Cattington because of course nobody ever really sees this it's like the one in Cattington it's in the Thames in the middle of nowhere um, so is it attracting fish or is it attracting birds that are in, attracted to the fish? Or oh, the other way around, sorry. So, I, as I said, it would be good to take a boat out there, put a camera down, and just have a look at it now and then, and see what is coming out. So from that published data uh, that, it, um, that the, the agency have of what the water company, Southwest Water, tell them in terms of the hours of spilling, these are those outfalls, and this is how many hours in each of these three years they were spilling. So you can see some of those overflows really didn't spill hardly at all, and a couple of them didn't spill very much last year, uh, but they did before. The biggest one, of course, is down here at the pumping station. What comes out here in the sea is, um, in theory, is mainly treated affluent, 
but there is a capacity for um, uh, untreated sewage to come out there as well. But uh, according to the data I've got, and I think it's this one down here, no untreated sewage has come out there. It all seems to come out here, just at the end of the sieve. I thought you might just like to see what progress has been made in terms of monitoring these overflows. So this is 2019. Um, each, this is the River Trust sewage map, as I showed. Each of these is an out an outfall storm overflow. The size of the brown spot it reflects the number of hours it's filling. Uh, that's 2019. 293,000 hours in all, average of 8.5 hours of spill. Here we are in 2022. Now, by the end of this year, every overflow should have one of these monitors on it. So that will be giving complete data by the end of the year. Um, can you notice there are some hot spots? around various rivers that you're familiar with, mm -hmm. the X and the X, etc. Um, and obviously South West Water have noticed that because they announced earlier this year that they're going to put money into these areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, for Sigma they announced they're going to do various things um, by 2028 in terms of improving the performance of those overflows. Now, we were discussing this earlier before we started, and it may have changed because at the 1st of October, Every water company has to produce a, a new plan, um, a business plan, and, and it's in that that they will have maybe change the amount they're investing in each of these areas. But certainly for Sigma, there are supposed to be plans to do stuff like that. Now what I wanted to do as well is to focus on a river, because I have a bee in my bonnet about this. People just talk about the individual, well, what does your works do, what does your works do? But think about what happens in a river catchment. So this is the River X. It has 18, well in 2019 there were 18 different overflows going into that river. And you could look at the data that's published on how many hours each of these spilled. Of course it's just hours, not volume. You don't really know what volume's going out. Just the number of hours. It could be a trickle, it could be a torrent. And I've highlighted in red the, the worst sort of the longest spilling ones. So that would, if you're, if you're, and I know there are people who are, who are doing a bit of a testing, that would tell you where to go and look, you know, interesting to see what, what, what does the river look like there? Like Ash is doing with his GoPro, go and do some videos. What does the river bed look like upstream, downstream of those overflows? <coughs> that would be an interesting thing to do. <clears throat> but it didn't tell you when to do it. Because this is the information the agency get, and they say, well, if we think there's something wrong, Look, we asked the water companies to give us all that detailed data. Well, I asked for that detailed data, you know, right away. I said, I don't want the summary data, really. I can get that from your website. I have to give a, submit a freedom of information request, and within a month, they have to provide the data. As you heard, Southwest Water refused to give data to me. Well, for Sigma, for now, they won't give you any data at all. They know what we do with it. We will expose what they're up to. But when you get that detailed data, and I did manage to get this before they closed down, this is what you see. So look, this is 2020, 12 months, each of those overflows, and exactly when they spill. So you can see December was pretty busy, as you can imagine. So imagine that when the river gets down, the axe gets down to the mouth, this is from sort of the, the headwater down to the mouth here, um, there's an accumulation of exposure. So when they say, oh, but you know, it's going into a, a swollen river and it's quite diluted, but it's already been exposed 18 times or more sometimes. You know, some of these rivers have got 40 overflows on them. Uh, so by the time you get to the mouth of the river, the, the exposure really is, it is just accumulated. Notice there's a spilling season. So down here, it starts around August, September, and it finishes about March, and then not much happens. So if you are interested in um, thinking, well, when would we go and say, do the filming? When would we go and do testing? Well, it's pretty obvious to me at the end of the spilling season, so you see the accumulated effect, and then is there any recovery over the summer? So do it then. At the beginning of the spilling season, has the river improved in any way? And then what about in the middle of the spilling season? Imagine Christmas Day, imagine Turkey. <laughs> 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 ah, go down the river. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, I wanted to talk a bit more about the actual illegality. Um, 
So these are sewage works I have looked at in the, the southwest area, where I was getting able to get data from um, southwest water up to about 18 months ago. Um, and some of those I have analyzed and, and published. So in some of our reports, if you go on our website, you'll see that information. The ones in pink are the ones when I, I tried to get data with the help of local people as well, uh, including here, uh, just couldn't get the data. So what I thought I'd do is, an interesting one is Countess Weir, which you know, uh, treats the sewage for Exeter, mm -hmm. and it's 10 times bigger than Sidmouth. Sidmouth has 14, 15,000 people. Countess Weir treats for 150,000, so I thought, well, that's an interesting comparison. And you can see it is a lot bit larger. Uh, and this is the, obviously the River X. I think this is a canal down here. I don't know. Yeah, the canal. Yeah, I think it's a canal, isn't it? The other interesting thing about this work is that it, it spills in, at two places. It has the normal storm tank outlet. So, you, know, you put stuff in a storm tank and then that fills that goes in the river. But it also has what's called an inlet overflow. And the, the idea of these is that if the sewage works is, is, is receiving a huge, huge amount, this is going to limit what's going to go in. And so it basically rejects anything over a certain amount. And I think it, it rejects anything over 2,000 litres a second um, at the beginning here. Um, and it has to keep on treating something like 900 litres a second. So when both of these things are in operation, you know what's coming in, you know what's coming out. So the difference is what's being spilled and treated. So that's one of the things I can do with this works. So if you look at, you know, when did it spill, the summary data, the hours, well, it's not very important. You could see it was increasing year by year from 2016. But actually, a lot of this is also weather sensitive. So in the dry years, like that we've had, uh, relatively speaking, compared to 2020, um, the hours have gone down. But as I've said, you know, it's volume that really mm. Do proper scientific study, you want that. <coughs> However, we can actually do something with volume. But let me show you an, an example of an illegal spill. Remember the conditions about um, spilling, you've got to, it's got to be due to rainfall, and you've got to keep treating to capacity. So I thought I'd just show you what happens normally. Um, I noticed the next talk mentions camel. So I thought, I'd make, this is my favorite thing. I say, normally when you measure the sewage being treated with sewage works, it looks like the, the back of the camel. <laughs> so the two humps each day. So this is two days in September 2020. Not much happens in the early hours of the morning. Although it's still about 20% of capacity. That must mean there's probably industrial input uh, or um, the infiltration due to leak pipes. And then around breakfast, you know, we're flushing toilets, having a shower, etc. So it increases. Goes down in the day, and we're getting the evening yeah. shut or whatever. And it would carry on like that. It's a happy day, it was too hot, too hot, it's too hot. But then when the rain comes, the treatment really starts to change, the pattern changes. So here, this green line is some, quite a bit of rain, 20 millimeters in a day. And you can see what happens. Now, it did actually spill on this day. And, and this is telling you exactly when it was spilling. Um, probably about 10 hours or something or more. And it's spilling pretty close to capacity here, but way below capacity here. So that's breaching the permit, and as a former head of the uh, chair of the EA said, if you're breaching the permit, you're acting illegally. So this is an illegal spill. So that, that should have been prosecuted. It's an illegal spill, it probably wasn't reported. Moreover, it's got that inlet overflow, and the inlet overflow spilled for three hours. Remember, that lets in 2,000 litres a second. So I can estimate, I know what's coming in and what's coming out, and it was six Olympic pools of untreated sewage came out in three hours. That's 15 million litres in three hours. And over the year, 265 million litres, or 106 Olympic pools, over 56 hours. And Ash was trying to convert this into a river. <laughs> what would we, we did a calculation at lunchtime. It was something like, it was like a, a, a river two meters deep, 25 meters wide, and 15 kilometers long. So it's a lot. I know there's some dilution. Well, you say to the water company, they haven't say it's diluted. I say, well, well, how much is it diluted by? They say, oh, we don't know. We don't measure volume. And I said, well, if you did measure volume, what would be a safe percentage? What would be a safe uh, dilution? Well, we don't know. 
how many measures that. So, you know, I just don't accept. In Scotland, they publish volume. Um, and so if in Scotland they can do it, they can do it because in England they often say, oh, it's technically difficult, challenging. I bet you've all got water meters on your home supply, haven't you? Most of you. Yeah. <laughs> so that's not technically challenging because it's earning them money. <laughs> so over the years, um, uh, we've expanded our interest and, and we started off, I should say that this was actually using artificial intelligence. I know that's got a bad um, reputation for some people. But that's what I used to do. I used to use AI techniques um, for analyzing children's brains and faces. And I applied that software unchanged to the water data. And we discovered a thousand unreported spills. Hundreds of them were illegal. Had just two sewage works operated by Thames Water. Then we expanded more Thames Water, then all the water companies. And as you can see, these were all reported in the Times. So they're in reports on our website. And earlier this year, I decided to look at the treated effluent, and I, I, I looked at 500 sewage works. 20% of them were breaching their permits on the level of ammonia. Uh, ammonia is really bad for fish, you know, so that, um, that was really important. And then I did something recently in May on volume and showed these 30 sewage works putting out the 11 billion litres. And that's just a minority of what's going there. That's just where I can estimate. Now, next Thursday, there'll be something, I hope, on the BBC about the latest stuff. So look out for it. And this is picking up 2,000 illegal spills in just 11 sewage works. Not in England, not in Ireland, not in Scotland. So it must be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Can't say any more. So I just wanted to finish. I thought, oh, God, oh gosh, it's 2 o'clock. Um, I just want to report some interesting scientific work. It's really relevant, I think, to the people who are doing the monitoring around here. This is a really interesting study done in Newcastle upon Tyne. The, the River Oosburn starts in the countryside, flows through the centre of Newcastle, throws through a glorious Victorian park that is used by hundreds of people in the summer. It has stepping stones put in by the council, where the children go in there, they paddle, they splash about, and it's got a waterfall, and there's all that vapour coming off of the waterfall. And, um, it's also got 18 sewage overflows. So this academic group at the University of Rockland, led by David Warner, work, work on, um, they did a study, and it's really interesting what they did. So they monitored at various places in the river, and they looked at what's coming out of those pipes. 5% of it's sewage. Doesn't sound a lot. But if you went to a swimming pool, and someone said, I oh, just flush the toilet with that sewage pool. 50 times, and that wouldn't even be 5%, you'd think, oh my god, that would be So 5% is pretty hard. And they used um, some new techniques for looking at environment in the air. So they could apportion that the bacteria in the, in, in the, in the, in the what's coming out of the pipes was 75% human in origin, and only 5% raw, the rest was from sort of road runoff and industrial. Um, and they were able to calculate the risk of splashing about in the water and inhaling and then being exposed to levels of E. coli and other bacteria. And so they actually recommend that if you've got a, a river that's receiving untreated sewage, go into a public space, treat it as if it's a bathing area and monitor it and test it properly. Um, oh, and we proved then what was said by Liv Garfield, the CEO of Seven Trentman, it's called in, in um, well, and if you almost called a lie about the Environment and Water Committee, she said, oh, it's just rainwater, really, that's all it is. One, other, one study that I think is really interesting for, for people here, uh, just announced uh, last month in <coughs> Oxford, they actually looked at river fly, um, you know, look, looked at the larvae of uh, um, uh, caddis fly and, and uh, other things like that, mayfly. They they've got a technique of finding sewage fungus when it, you can't see it with the unaided eye. They looked at phosphate and nitrate. And they showed that the difference between upstream and downstream, as you would expect, higher nature is higher uh, nutrients, higher levels of sewage fungus downstream, increase in things that cause the blue-green algae blooms. And it's slightly surprising that higher numbers of these invertebrates. But what they found was that they had a complete um, imbalance. So the ones that could tolerate sewage became huge numbers and the others were in small numbers. 
So the biodiversity just got turned, um, as they called it, unhealthy. Um, now I wanted to mention that one, I know we're going a bit over time, I hope you don't mind. Uh, we did start a little bit, uh, 10 minutes past two. Um, that, that, that study was just looking at treated effluent. And I wanted to show you uh, what is happening with treated effluent. People you know, concentrating on the spills, but actually you should be looking at what's been coming out as treated. This is a, the works that Ash was talking about, Carlton. These are the 12 tests a year that they do, and they choose. And you can see relative to, the, to the, the permit level, this is the permit level which you can kind of break twice in a year without breaching your permit. What I noticed was that they always seem to test between seven and two. And I thought, that's a bit funny, why do they do that? So I then got 27,000 sample data from the EA database. And that's what they all do. All water companies only test between seven in the morning and two in the afternoon. It's like, what's that about? Well, if you remember from earlier, there are two humps of sewage. The first hump gets monitored, the second hump doesn't. Huh, why do they do that? So we found out that Carson Sewage Works had another demolishing device which measures the ammonia every 15 minutes. But this is not reported to the agency because it's their own private. They said they just do it to get an idea of what's going on. <laughs> the other is just the spot testing that takes out of sending the lab. So we asked for that data using freedom of information. And look at these results. So before seven and in the afternoon and the evening, they're breaching their permit left, right, and centre. So is that a coincidence? <laughs> and I believe this is happening, as I said, you know, at 20% of these. Just very quickly, I think microplastics is going to be very important in the future. Mm. Um, Jamie um, Woodward at Manchester University showed that the rivers around Manchester are the most polluted with microplastics in the world, found so far. And that's because of all these untreated sewage um, spills. If you treat sewage properly, 99% of microplastics is taken out. Of course, it goes into sludge and then onto farmland, but that's another story. It actually is going into the, into the riverbed, and then when you get a big storm, it gets washed out into the sea. So the, the river eye um, foremen are being exposed to the microplastics, and then the marine life gets it. And what do we find? Another study. The macroinvertebrates have got microplastics in their bodies. The fish have got microplastics in their bodies. It's pretty obvious where this is going. Dolphins have got microplastics if you compare it to the fish, and they're also being exposed to the microplastics. What do microplastics do? They cause an inflammatory response, uh, they affect your endocrine system, your ability to reproduce. Dolphins' testes are shrinking, the sperm counts are going down, and it's, it's happening, you know, obviously, in other, other species. So, as a kind of suggested to-do list, uh, I, I thought, if, if any local people are already doing various testing, I, I, I would really recommend that you, as Ash has been doing, do some GoPro filming. That really gives you a great idea, um, view of what's happening under the water. Because when you just go and look at the river, you often don't see really what the riverbed's like, especially if it's murky, because it's polluted. Um, get the data when you can. Uh, get your MP maybe to try and twist their arm and get the data. Link it with your river testing data. Put pressure on your MP to make sure that they're making the data available, because actually, as you've heard, they're not it should be freely available on the website for people to download. Um, get money given to the Environment Agency, get them to uh, employ people like me who do the data analysis. They're not really doing it properly. Maybe now they're doing this big investigation, um, but it's taking them time. Get rid of operator self monitoring. This must be, we should be, we should have an independent body testing what it was, so we're not relying on them to do it, and bring in volume meters and other things. So I'll finish with this while you're thinking of questions, if we've got time for some. This is, the, um, this is how people in the water industry explain the, the water cycle. You know, extract it from rivers, clean it up, we drink it, we use it, wash off the garden, <coughs> which we shouldn't really. And then some of the grey water gets cycled back for treatments, but, but the really dirty stuff goes to the sewage works into the river. 
Well, this is actually what's happening. The water cycle in England at the moment looks very much like this. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> On the left. <laughs> very much. So it's going to have pro cameras out in a boat and lots of other things to do. Um, thank you. Yeah. That's so so helpful, all your advice. Tremendous talk. So um, questions. Uh, Mr. Barlow? Yes. Uh, so can private individuals or town councils take water companies to the court? Can we, can we sue them? Right. Well, there's, there are, there's a recent judgment that does indicate that the private prosecutions are going to be viable because actually, for most pros most pollution incidents, the environment agency is the lead prosecutor. So you can kind of start off your work. You'll find obstruction, including by the environment agency, in getting, getting the evidence, and then the agency can take over your prosecution, and you can imagine where that's going to go. But so watch this space with with agencies like Wild Fish. Wild Fish has got a solicitor. They've, they've done a lot um, in, in terms of judicial review and challenges. And, they're, they're, and we are talking to a bunch of lawyers at the moment who are all interested in using the law in different ways. So there is potential for that. But um, don't rush into it. Can I, <laughs> can I just add to that that um, th th these are all the investigations going on at the moment. So off what the environment agency investigating the water companies. The, um, we got involved with a, a group of environmental lawyers in the day. Um, unfortunately, we were asking for a judicial review of whether or not um, we're doing their job properly. We went to High Court and the judge turned it down. Um, the House of Lords Committee investigating off work. There's um, the Office for Environmental Protection, which were introduced after Brexit because they needed an extra body to oversee the whole process. They're investigating the agency and off what? And DEFRA. <laughs> Wild fish, as you heard, have been challenging in various ways. Some of their things have been successful. I'm currently part of a big consortium which is challenging six water companies and um, saying that they've, uh, they're monopolies, they're, they're, they're cheating, they're not telling the truth about um, what they're doing, and uh, therefore they need to um, give some money back. Um, the, the challenge has gone to seven Trent Water, and if, and if they're found guilty, that will be three hundred million pounds. Overall, it will be eight hundred million pounds, and thirty-six million will have to be raised to actually get this case going. So that's a big one. So that's an extension to your, your question. Uh, oh, um, excuse me. I believe the uh, RMPs have had the opportunity to to vote on on, on legislation once in October of 2021, and once again in, in January of this year. Do you have any comments on that? Well, that was um, a House of Lords amendment called the Wellington Amendment to the Environment Act. Um, and it was a kind of subtle change in the, in the wording. Um, the, the, the government wanted to um, put conditions like, um, they've got to be seen to be making less of an impact um, as opposed to you know details about reducing numbers of spills and, and, and etc. And um, I think um, I think it went through the House of Lords and it went back to the House of Commons, um, and um, a lot of MPs, uh, you know, under pressure, um, still resisted and voted with the government. You know, a lot of Tory MPs. And that, that amendment was rejected. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and a lot of, and the, uh, there were a lot of the blue plaques put up outside the houses of um, a lot of the MPs saying that they voted for more spilling. Um, do you want to add to that? Well, that was it. They had the simple choice make water companies obey the law or let them get away with it for the next 30, 20, 30 years. And they voted with the government, supported by a bunch of, of fake news facts from DEFRA that this was going to cost the taxpayer £500 billion, pounds, a number dreamed up by a consultant employed by Water UK for that very purpose. And, the, and the, those MPs went with it. They, like our own MP, he knew he could come to us and ask us what was true, but he didn't. It was a three-line whip, 
It was it was stick vote with the government, and they and they pushed it through. And then they get very niggly now when people point out that they did that and stick it back up. Well, tough. They they should have thought about that at the time. That's a toxic vote that they will never shake off. Mm. They, they they let the country down that day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's you're advocating use of volumetric data. Have you had any discussions with water companies about getting those meters in? I wouldn't think they're very. As I said, um, most of them say it's technically challenging and expensive, and it'll cost the customer the money, <laughs> of course. Um, but the technical challenge, as I said, you know, Scottish Water reported their data uh, earlier this year, and at least 40 of the sewage works, they actually put volume data out. Yeah. You should have seen the volumes. Um, I'm just looking at a few of those at the moment. Um, to be so the problem here is there's a huge disconnect between, say, from ADM, which is duration, so it's qualitatively volumetric, I guess, and the standards for setting bathing water quality, which are, which are volumetric. Plus, well, so also, the amount of scientists. So, if you're going to do a proper scientific yeah. sort of analysis of what's the effect on the river, you really should be measuring the volume. Not, not yeah. how often did it do it? Yeah. It could be just a little trickle. Some of these works, what you notice is they spill every five minutes a little bit and a little bit. Some of them spill for an hour and or three hours. You saw, mm. uh, and and it's you know multiple Olympic pools worth. So mm. it, it, volume really is, it is. But we also put this too. We had a, a face to face meeting um, with Alan Lovell, the new chair of the Environment Agency. He was got invited to a private sort of meeting with some people he knew uh, who lived on the River Colm. And then he realized that we were invited to it. It was all quite civil, but at the lunch, I said, you know, various things, you know, about volume metering, you know, he, he rejected that. We had a meeting with David Black, the, the head CEO of Ofwat. Volume metering, no. So they're, they're just resisting it. But if you're doing, um, if you want to do bathing quality, I really recommend talking to Ilkley Clean River Group and SOS Whitstable. Mm. They're both really good at it. And, and actually getting bathing quality water is just the first step. After that, you've got to get the money out of the water company to actually do something. Mm. Otherwise, the environment agency will just shut you down for having dirty water. Mm. So it, it's, it's, it's a good part of the fight. But well, it's well, well I I'm come from Exmouth. And right. that has exits that have got a blue flag beach, oh, yeah. and it's excellent bathing water quality. Yeah. And there's an outlet right on the beach, yeah, yeah, yeah. hundred yards where people well, swim. And no, not many people know that. And we know that the environment agency, if they get a result that's a bad result, they have been in another one. Plus, they only monitor from May to September. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Yes. Yeah. Mm. I think they also. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have another yeah. handy slide with the timeline? Yeah. Well, if you'll excuse yeah. the phrase. I'm sorry. Do you have a slide? Shows the timeline of when it all went shit shaped. <laughs> was it when, as Ash points out, all these companies from Canada and China started investing, or, or was it when my husband says when he used to swim in flat pool as a little boy, it was called bobbing through the motions? So, is it this story? Yeah. I, when did it really begin to get so bad? I, I think it. I think it got bad before privatisation, deliberately. Then it picked up a bit, and while water companies were finding their feet and then learning about financial engineering, it, uh, it got better because they took the stranglehold off, off the business. And then, it, and then as they found out that the, the big investment firms came in, the big, uh, the big funds that, that do the, the, uh, the asset stripping, they hollow it out with debt, they borrow money to pay back to investors. Anglin Water paid themselves a dividend of 1.94 billion pounds in, in 2018 which was more than their, their income, because they thought they were going to get privatised. Those were the kind of Corbyn years when they, were, they thought they were going to, going to lose the business. Uh, but I think you can see a big downturn. A lot of people talk about this anecdotally, but you can also see it in the, in the data, I think, from 2009, 2010, which was when operator self-monitoring came in. It could be a coincidence, but that's when water companies learned that they could manipulate the data and they could do what they wanted to do. And we've done a check of I did a, a, a study of the auditing, the, the claimed auditing, and found that, for example, Southern Water hadn't been audited since, I think, 2013, one of the worst companies. Other, many other companies, Southwest Water, had, had got some big gaps in its auditing. It's just simply not true that the Environment Agency checks up on what the water companies do. It's, a, it's just a lie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Can I ask, first of all, is the canal system relatively safe from this because it's a static uh, 
of the system. And just a comment, you've got to go for the snake's head here. Private equity is taking over every aspect of our lives. Yeah. You can't even die today yeah. without bumping into a private equity yeah. outfit who's yeah. just ripping off everybody. Yeah. So I just make that comment. But are canals safe, relatively speaking? Uh, well, some of the sewage works I've looked at, the rivers interact with the canal. Mm -hmm. So actually there's a, an overflow between them. So they're not all, all, all the way, but, No, there, there will be discharges. I know of discharges into canals. They discharge into the lakes. Yeah. Lake Windermere, if you look at, if you yeah. see yeah. Matt Staniak, who we, we have the, the close contact with, his, his Lake Windermere, you think of the greatest, beautiful, protective piece of water, is bombarded by sewage from the United Utilities. And that's going nowhere but into the lake, and it, which goes green, yeah. spectacularly green, as many do. And United Utilities won't give any data to us. So how do we solve the problem? <laughs> well, the, the, the snake's head, we, we absolutely think that, that the answer is to, is there is no um, make water companies perform better. Let's you know. Let's make the CEOs take less spectacular bonuses. You need to take the profit motive out. It needs to be. It needs to be a non-profit business because let's. This is the thing that we're trying to work on next. Water companies investment has been investing your money. 160 billion pounds. We had this conversation with Ofwat. It's not been. It's not been investment from outside. It's been what it's been Bill Payer's money that's been invested. The, the idea that these shareholders bring something other than they buy a, they buy a ticket initially for their share in the industry, a redeemable ticket that will probably go up in value, and after that they've got permission to just feed off the trough of money that the captive Bill Payer has to put in every year. We're trying to get this out into the public arena because that is the ultimate exposure that privatised water and many other privatisations are simple scam. So you're just being held victim to, to the, the predatory nature of private equity, which is all about sucking out as much as possible. If they can cheat, they will cheat. And they can cheat, and they will cheat. And that will never change until that model changes. Um, Marianne? Um, looking at the videos that you showed, there's, they're not river beds, but they're like little bits of gravel where obviously fish can spawn. Yeah. And you showed us that had a little foliage growing and um, greenery growing through the large roads, etc. If all this were reversed tomorrow, how long would it take for the river to dispose itself to watch it in the stone? Yeah, okay, well I think that depends very much on the nature of the river. I think in a fast river, we like if you get a flood like we do on the wind rush. By, by spring after the sorry yeah by, by spring after uh, the the river has been rushing through pushing the pushing the uh, water through pushing all of the 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 crap out you can get quite a good honeymoon period at the beginning of the year but I mean there, there's also quite a lot of residual uh, nitrate and phosphate in, in the in the sediment so it could take a little bit longer but you, you generally you see a pretty pretty rapid turnaround and, and you know there's a lot of money spent on greenwashing where water companies will pay to get river adjustments to river banks make them smaller make the rivers narrower so they run faster the answer is if you put clean water in any rubbish in habitat life will come to it and live in it and it will be and it will be beautiful you can mess around with the decoration and the banks and the trees and the plants but if you've got a, a, a trough of dirty polluted water running through it you are wasting your time and and that we should not let them distract us from that or from the fact that they're breaking the law sorry can i just have do you have a view about fines on water companies <coughs> do you have a view about fines on water companies yes i, I do. assume that that impacts what they're investing in the environment not on the people who are actually getting the money out of the system yeah, in, in, in 2017, Thames Water was fined £20 million. Pounds. It was a spectacular fine at the time. It was for four years of, of, of pollution, around about 2013, uh, those years. And I worked out that the money that they made during that period by breaking the law, and remember they only got prosecuted for a small amount of what they were, what they were doing, that fine represented 2.4% of the money they made. So it was as if they processed it through PayPal. The chief executive <laughs> of the of the agency said that will teach them and of course it taught them it taught them that pollution was exactly the way to make money so it's a waste of time if you're going to find somebody find this find the board of directors yeah. Yeah. 
then that won't happen. It simply won't happen. Yeah, take, take them, take their money away. You know, look, they, they are. They say they don't get it in the morning, intending to pollute. Of course they do. They make deliberate decisions that they are going to keep these places operating illegally, and it's amazing. In the waste industry, the proceeds of crime act has been used many, many times over. People have gone to jail in the waste industry for, for doing the same offences that these water chief executives are doing. Mm. The, the proceeds of Crime Act has never been used against the water company and, and a director has never even been into court in the water industry. And we're trying to change that because that that is long overdue. And if you had volume meters, you could actually, that would be a way of charging them. So the bigger spill they make, the more you charge them. As, in, as a levy, not necessarily even as a fine. But is there a danger that that's come, going to come away from the environmental work they should be doing? <clears throat> I mean, is it, is, it, is it going the wrong way, in a sense, unless you direct the fine at the people that are responsible? Yeah, it, otherwise you just take it, as with Ofwat, they're taking <clears throat> money, giving the bill payer back a fiver or something, and then cha charging the bill payer an extra 200 quid or yeah. something. This yeah. is, you know, this is, yeah. smoke and mirrors at a ridiculous level that Ofwat doesn't understand. And that two hundred hundred million pounds could be directed to doing something useful <coughs> for the water industry, but you can't trust the water industry with money. You just cannot. We see how much they charge for things. We see what they've done with the money. They're very good. But it, they, I don't think they see it because it's all people in offices doing what they're told to do. But they are breaking the law and they are scamming the public on an epic scale that, that is like the environmental crime of the century, in my opinion. So, so on that, that response,